Income tax 2023-2024 rental property where we are renting part of the property and or where we change from personal use of the property to rental use of the property tax software example. Get ready and some coffee because we're looking to get the tax man off our back with income tax preparation 2023-2024. Here we are in our first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Perform 1040 example problem using Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to software, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website at irs.gov irs.gov standard starting point here we've got adam taxman just trying to avoid a dang taxman he's living in beverly hills 90210 single to start off with no dependents we're going to start with w2 income and then add the rental property schedule e standard deduction at the 13850 getting us to the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula called not net income taxable income 86150 page 2 calculating the tax federal income tax 14266 that's our starting point let's go back to page number 1 we're going to imagine a rental property situation but let's first imagine that he is living in a home for his personal residence and then is going to be moving from that place to some other place and converting the prior home from personal residence to rental property in the case where it's his principal residence he might still get a deduction on the schedule a but only if the itemized deductions are greater than the standard deduction which for a single filer is that 13 uh, 850 the big things that push people over to itemizing typically being connected to the home the mortgage interest related to the loan on the home not the mortgage payments but the interest portion of course and then we have also the property taxes so let's imagine that situation first where he's not taking the standard deduction but is getting some benefit from the itemized deductions because of his home and the deductibility of those items uh, within it. So we're gonna go to the itemized deductions and let's say that for the interest, we have the real estate taxes. That's, I went to contributions, didn't I? So here we are on the interest. Let's say the interest was 15,000, just to pick a round number. And let's say the taxes, we have real estate taxes, which are gonna be for the principal residence of let's say 5,000 to pick a, a nice easy number to be working with. Now we'll just add those and look at the impact if it was the principal residence. We go back to the forms, still has the 100,000 of income. And now we're not taking the standard deduction, which was the 13,850 for a single filer, but rather the uh, 21,205. We now have the schedule A, which has been put into play. Let's go into it and we can see that on the tax side of things there's the 5000 also opening up the possibility of, of deducting other taxes like the state taxes and uh that comes out to 6205 and then we have the 15000 of the mortgage interest giving us that 21205 now remember that when we think about deductions usually from an income tax system, the natural deductions we would expect are those things we needed to expend in order to generate revenue because an income tax does not make sense to 
put it on the gross income, but rather on the net income. If you tax the gross income, then you're going to be greatly benefiting those types of businesses that don't need a lot of expenditures in order to generate the revenue. This is often lost on many people because most people have this W-2 income, number one, and as an employee, and the IRS likes this structure because they can force the employer to do all the work, right, of reporting the taxes. As an employee, it's assumed you don't have money business expenses because the employer is taking care of it. So we don't see those natural kind of deductions as we do when we have a Schedule C uh, or a Schedule E, for example. And we also have the other kinds of deductions which aren't really natural to an income tax system, but are rather the government trying to nudge us, influence our behavior for better or for worse, playing politics, giving out gifts and whatnot, and dealing with lobbyists and whatnot, right? And that's a lot of what's happening on the Schedule A. So medical expenses, for example, you can make an argument for them, but it's not really a natural thing that you needed to consume to generate revenue, justifying it for an income tax deduction. Same with the taxes here. These are personal taxes on your personal residence. That doesn't seem like the type of thing you would normally be able to deduct for a normal federal income tax system. This is why I'm just explaining why it might confuse people a little bit when we then move to deducting these on the rental property, which does make more sense just from a natural income tax system. The interest here, again, doesn't exactly make sense if it's our principal residence that we get to deduct it. It would make more sense if we've got the financing in order to start a business to generate revenue because then it would be an ordinary and necessary business expense. So when we own property, we start to think, well, these are just, I get to deduct these no matter what, which is kind of the case, but remember it's on the schedule A, which might not benefit you as much if you're not taking the itemized deductions because you have to clear the standard deductions to get that uh, number one. And number two, you're still limited to other ki kinds of things that you don't get as a personal residence that you might get as a deduction if it was rental property generating income, such as the depreciation of the property itself and the repairs and maintenance and that kind of stuff for the rental property. So now let's imagine that it was converted from the personal use of the property to the rental use of the property. Well, what would happen at that point, we would have to then put it on the books possibly so that we can not only take the mortgage interest and the the real estate taxes but also the depreciation the question then is going to be well what's going to be the cost of the property i haven't been tracking it because i didn't get to depreciate it before so i have to go back and figure okay what did i pay for it what's the cost now it gets more complicated if you inherited it or it was gifted to you by your parents or something like that but let's say we bought it before for like 100,000 and let's say that we had an improvement on it. I probably spelled that wrong for like 20,000. So let's say then our basis we're going to say is like 100,000. I can compare that to the fair market value, which I might look up on, on like related properties that have been sold to get an idea. Hopefully my house has gone up in value over time, which is often the case. And one of the benefits of real estate, just the property itself because of the scarcity of land goes up over time, possibly, hopefully is part of the thing. So let's say that that uh, the fair market value was only like, like uh, 60,000, right? Then, or then we would be taking the the uh, basis, the adjusted basis of wait, I went the wrong way there. Let's say the fair market value was like two hundred thousand or something like that, right? So that that would mean we would most likely be taking our adjusted basis, not the fair market value. We're going to take the lower of the two. Note that from our perspective, we would like to take the higher of the two because whatever amount we put on the books is a potential it's like potential energy it's like holding up a rock it has potential energy uh in it right uh whereas that's what we have here we got the potential so we like the basis to be as high as possible because that's going to give us a tax benefit in the future the irs of course is going to want the basis 
lower uh, so that so, so you don't have as much potential energy for the tax benefit, right? So we have to take the lower of the two. So let's imagine it's this 120. Now the next thing is, well, what if I need to break it out between the land and the building? And what if I don't know what the breakout is at the point of purchase? Well, you could look at the property tax statement, which might not be uh, 120,000. Let's say the property tax statement valued your home at 90,000 or something like that for property taxes for whatever reason. I can still look at the breakout of the 90,000. Maybe it was building was was 70,000 and the land was uh, 20,000. So that comes out to a total of the sum of those is 90,000. So what's the percent breakout between the building and the land? It would be the 70,000 divided by 90. I'm going to percentify that home tab number group percentify. And then it would be the 20,000 divided by the 90 home tab number group percentify. And then I could do 90 divided by 90 or sum this up and it should come out to one. Okay, and so then I can use that same breakout and say, okay, if I put it on the books at 120,000, I'm gonna say land, uh, let's say building, building versus land and total should add up to 120, right? So the building is gonna be equal to 120,000 times the 78% about and the, the this times the 22% about summing that up, we're going to get to the 120. So this is one way we might be able to break out between building and land, which is often going to be a problem. So it's going to be a problem to get the basis because we're going to have to go back in time, figure it out compared to the fair market value. And then we're going to have to basically break out between building and land, which we might not readily have possibly using property tax statements that make that breakout, but might not tie out exactly to your adjusted basis, therefore using some kind of ratio analysis so we can explain the process and have a rational process to explain in the event of an IRS audit or something like that, right? All right, so now we can put it on the books so we can say, all right, let's put, the, let's put this thing on the books, man. We're gonna say this is gonna be depreciation and I'm gonna say building. Now you probably wanna put the address and whatnot of the building in the event that you become a, a billionaire and you start having multiple properties around the globe and you wanna keep track of them. But for generic problem purposes, I'm just gonna call it building. And so we're gonna say building and we're gonna say it was, we're gonna put it on the books for 93, 93, 333. And so d -d -d value must be between, oh, it's a category. This is building. Okay. And then it's going to go on. Let's say we did this on 03, 30, let's say 03, 01, 2, 3. Cost. Now I got, now I forgot what the cost is. 93, 3, 3, 3. 9, 3, 3, 3, 3. Method. It's going to be residential rental property, 27 years, makers. Makers 27.5 straight line. That's just uh, the, what it is. So we're going to say, okay. And then I'll put the land on there, even though I can't depreciate it. Land three, boom, boom. It's going to be land at also 0301.23. It's on the books for 26.667. 26667. That adds to 120. So although I can't depreciate the land, the depreciation schedules now help me to determine and track the adjusted basis as I consume the potential energy in the form of a deduction and the adjusted basis goes down as we do this. Now this is land, so I'm not gonna get any depreciation from it. So that's gonna be uh, the general idea if we had it for the entire year, right? Uh, I'm sorry. We, we did the transfer in uh, March, so first. So we're gonna say, okay, so it's only gonna give us that part of mid-month depreciation, you would think. So we're imagining we moved out of the property, 
we were living somewhere else, possibly renting or something at the moment, and we then are renting out our prior property, which was our principal residence, starting on 3123. All right, let's go back to the forms. I can see the depreciation. Let's, I have to add a Schedule E uh, to make this work. Let's go back to the Schedule E, and I'm just going to do a generic Schedule E. And let's say we had rental income of, let's say, uh, well, I'm just going to put a round number. Let's say it was 100,000, but we had advertising of like 80,000. So it's just going to be 20,000 of revenue to do it. Okay. And then if I go back to my depreciation, this is going to be activity one. Okay. I think we're good now. All right depreciation schedules so now now we've got the 93 333 and so on that's going to be a straight line mid-month convention which means we're getting just for the part of the year in the middle of like 315 on to december right 27.5 there's the amount of depreciation we don't get any depreciation on the land but we want the land on the books to help us track the adjusted basis that's going to go into the schedule e so now we've got the 100,000 minus the 80 and then we've got the added depreciation so that's bringing us to the 17,313 uh, that we have here and so and that pulls into the schedule one there's that and that goes into the form 1040. okay what about the what about the mortgage interest and whatnot so now i had five thousand of mortgage interest and I, I'm going to have to break that out between now the part of the year that it was used for rental property versus my principal residence, right? So I still get these benefits, but I have to break out for the part of the year that it was personal versus business. Okay. So I can kind of do this in Excel. I can say, okay, what's the percentage of, of the year here that we, that we broke out? We're going to say, all right, we had it, we transferred it. So we had two months that we had it uh, versus the 12 minus two, right? And that's gonna give us our 12 months, right? So, so that means that it was personal property for two out of 12 months and it was 10 out of 12, it was rental property. So let's percentify that, summing that up boom so that's kind of the breakout that we can use so when we're when we're trying to say okay what's going to be the rental versus personal so i'm going to say rental versus personal for these deductible amounts i might be able to deduct them both possibly but need to be breaking them out between the rental and the personal schedule a and schedule e so i'm going to say all right this is going to be the rental is going to be the fifteen thousand times the rental portion, which was 83%. I'm going to select F4 on the keyboard so I can copy that down. And so that would be that portion. And then I'd say the personal side, I could say this is going to be the 15,000 times that two months or 17% uh, percent F4 on the keyboard so I can copy it down. And then I'll copy that down. I can also calculate that second part this way. This minus this should come out to the same number. I could double check to get back to the total, I should be able to sum the rental and personal up and get me back to the total. So this might be a worksheet that you kind of put together to try to to try to break out some of your uh, expenses, right? If you have this kind of situation happening, you might try to break out your total expenses and then break out the personal versus uh, rental in some way, shape or form like this. For these particular two, you can break, you, you might be able to deduct both of them on different forms. Other expenses, let's say, let's say you had repairs or something on the entire home uh, for, for, for the, or let's say you had like some other expense like utilities or something. Obviously you might do it on a month by month basis because you might pay it monthly. But let's say you have an expense that you only have it on a yearly basis, right? So you have this expense that was for a year uh, that was for like $1,000. So again, you would do the same thing, breaking out between the business and personal. But 
if it's not these two, you're not going to get a deduction here. And we'll see this in depreciation, for example, when we calculated the depreciation, which is typically done on the tax software side, not on the bookkeeping side, we only got the portion of the depreciation for the year that it was rental property, not for the you know the months that it was personal use property. In other words, the only the only expenses we typically might be able to get on the schedule A again are related to the mortgage interest and the property taxes. Uh, okay, so if I come over back over here, it might look something like this. So now I'd have to go back into like the schedule E, let's say, and say, okay, so now we've got the mortgage interest da -da, and the property taxes at on the schedule E at the 125 and the 4167, which ties out to these two numbers. Right. And then on the on the personal side of things on the schedule A, I have to adjust that so I don't, I'm not double dipping on the same numbers. And I would have to say that the principal residence now we're going to say is two five two five. Uh, and hold on a sec. No, this should be two five mortgage interest two five and then the property tax and then the 833 so hopefully i did that right 833 the point is if i go back on over now i get the deduction here uh on the schedule e and notice the schedule a is gone because now even though i still get those amounts to deduct it's below the threshold my total has now dropped far below the threshold and that's again one of the the detriments of the of the itemized deductions if it goes below a certain threshold even though you might have some of them you're not going to get a benefit from them until it goes over that bit but the idea would be here that if you reported the schedule a and the schedule e the property taxes on the interest should add up to what is reported by the bank on the form 1098 if you report more then if you deduct more than was reported on the form 1098 that is something the irs will probably red flag automatically because they don't even need a human being to check that right they're just going to say hey look this return has more deducted for these interest mortgage interest either on the schedule e and the schedule a than we got 1098s for so there might be weird situations where that happens but you have to you know be careful double check those things to make sure you're not double dipping on the mortgage interest Okay, so now let's change the scenario a bit and let's imagine that instead of us having our personal residence, we moved out entirely and then rented our prior personal residence. Let's say that we're going to rent out part of our personal residence. So it's still our home, but we're renting out part of it. So when that is the case, then you have a similar situation that you would have to be doing for uh, the schedule a because part of the place is now still uh, your home and then part of its rental for the year uh, and then you also have this situation with the depreciation but instead of being able to depreciate let's start with the depreciation now you're only depreciating the part of the property which is one unit it's mixed together right because you're living in it that you only get to depreciate the part that's for the rental purposes so we might still say, okay, well, I'll put the property on the books. Maybe it'd be nice to put it on at the, at the 93 instead of adjusting it uh, down first, you put it on there at the full thing and then use the software to say, this is the percent of the basis that is for business use. So we can still track the total cost of the place and the business use. So for, in other words, how would we figure out the business use versus the personal use? The most common way would be to say square footage. So we probably have the square footage of the home because it would be on Zillow or whatever the, you know, the, when, and on the sales documents and whatnot. Uh, and then we would have to figure out the square footage of the room or the part of the home that we are renting. And then we can say, use a percent calculation. So if we're renting a room or rooms at 250 square feet, which we might have to pull out the good old ruler and kind of measure and whatnot, versus the square footage of the home which we can probably look up in our purchasing documents or online then the percent then is 250 over that 1200 that means of the home we're basically renting 21 percent of it therefore we should get the 
potential benefit uh, of depreciation, the potential energy for 21% of, of the part of the home that was the building, meaning this 93,333 that we broke out, we're only going to get 21% of that as the basis that we can then apply out, right? So, so that would be, in other words, this times the building portion is going to be this times this, boom, right? So I can go over here and say, okay, well, how can we do that? Instead of me putting this on the books for just the 19444 and depreciating that amount, I'm going to put it on the book still at the uh, 93. And then I'm going to go down here and say that it was a percent of business use. The business use percent is 21%. So I'll say 21%. And then and I have to do it with a decimal, 0.21. And then over here, I'll do the same thing for the land, even though we're not uh, depreciating land and say 0.21. And then if I go back to my expenses, we can say, okay, the depreciation schedules, it's now on the books for the 93.333, but the, the business percent is only 21%. Therefore, pulling out the trustee calculator, the amount of the basis we get to depreciate is 93333 times 0.21 or the 196 about, right? And that's the amount that we're applying the straight line mid-month conviction 27 years to, which comes down to only $564 this time because, again, we, only, we didn't get to depreciate the full property because we're only really renting 21% of it is the general idea. That then is what is pulling over here to the depreciation schedules on the schedule e and the part of the depreciation that is personal which now in our scenario we've got two things going on we've got one that we didn't convert it until M march 1st so we only got part of the year of depreciation on that 19600 and we have the same property so the property value we only got 19.6 of the full property, right? And the other, and the and the rest of it is going to be personal. That also could have an impact. Note on when we sell the property, our adjusted basis is going down, which means the gain could go up. And the fact that part of the property is now for business or rental usage could complicate things when we're trying to get that exemption when we sell the principal residence, which often wipes out the gain. So something just to keep in mind if you're thinking about selling the property in any f coming up point quickly so that you can uh, see what implications might have on your potential gain in that scenario. Okay, so then, then notice our calculations over here for our other expenses also become a little bit more complicated, especially in the first year. Because in the first year, we have two things going on. It was personal property that was converted to rental property. And the property once converted had a personal component and a rental component to it. Notice in year two and going forward after that point, we will have multiple things that have been worked out making things easier. One, the property will hopefully be on the books correctly and the software will calculate depreciation properly going forward. And two, we won't have the partial year thing where the whole property was personal versus uh, the business situation as we have in year one. So for example, this let's imagine the same scenario. We have this breakout between the, the rental and personal usage for the portion of the year that was rental and personal. So now this would be the expenses that were applied to the to the rental portion of the year. Let's bring those same numbers down here just to get an idea. So now I'm going to say this is going to be my rental starting point, basically. But that would be for the portion of the year that it was was rented. So now I'm going to say that, I, but it was only rented. 21 percent was was the rental portion of that for the portion of the year so we can say all right that means that the rental part of that the rental part of that is this times the 21 percent and then i'm going to say f4 
so I can copy that down. That's rental. The other part of that, even though I transferred it to rental property, I only transferred part of the property, right? So this is still personal here. And so on the personal side, we've got this times, or let's just subtract it out. It's, it's going to be this minus this is that. And then I can double check my totals. This is the sum. Da -da. This equals the sum. Why didn't I just copy it down? I don't know. So, so now we've got, this is the actual, so this is the actual uh, rental usage of, of the, of the interest, the property taxes. And then this is going to be the expenses, any other expenses for the year. Uh, we'd have to break out between the rental portion of the unit for the portion of the year that we used it versus the uh, personal side of things. So, so now, again, if I go back on over and say, all right, there might be a cleaner way to break this out in the first year. So I'm kind of just putting this together fairly quickly. But notice in the first year, we have two things going on. We converted the property. So it's only been rented for part of the year, number one. And then number two, we only have one property that has a rental portion and a personal portion. If it was year two, and let's say that this was our, our expenses, that would be easier because then we wouldn't have to allocate between the portion of the year that was rental versus non-rental. We would just allocate through the portion of the property that was used for rental and non-rental. But so that's the idea. So in any case, let's go back on over and say, all right, well, then if I go back to my schedule E, then we can say the mortgage interest here do, 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 on the schedule E is now the this portion of it is 2604. So now we have 2604 and the real estate taxes are at real estate taxes 868. So 868. The rest of it we might still be able to deduct on once again the schedule a for those two particular expenses because it would still be part of our principal residence possibly so now one way you might do that in the software is you might put the total here so here's the total which was five thousand and then subtract out the schedule e which was we said uh rental 868 so negative 868 this can kind of help you to track what's happening when you double check your your numbers so this would be like the total was 15,000 the schedule e was d -d 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 the schedule e was 2604 hopefully i got that right Negative two six. If I get it wrong, you hopefully get the idea of it. I think I, I think that works. So then, if I go back on over, one now the schedule A is back because this is a much smaller portion that we got to allocate to the the rental property here, and the rest is going to go to the schedule A. The general idea being the same in that remember that the government has this ten ninety eight uh, report in the mortgage interest. So you want to make sure that you're double checking the mortgage interest here versus the schedule E so that you're getting all of your mortgage interest broken out properly and not going over the, the amount reported on the 1098 because then you would be double dipping and will most likely get some uh, contact from the IRS because they can check that with an automated system without even a person to check it because they have the 1098. But also note if you, if you go to the schedule A, and I was to check, I was to check, you know, these numbers, I could go back into the data input screen at least and kind of see how I came to those numbers and check that against the 1098 uh, form, which could be make it a little bit easier possibly. Okay, next example. Now let's imagine that instead of us one moving out of the property, making it rental property or converting it from personal to rental, but just a room in it, 
we're going to say that we have a separate property, which we might say would be a second residence, but we're only using it as a vacation home now. So now it's a vacation home. Now, if it was separate property and it was just rental property and we didn't use it, we didn't use it personal for personal use, then it would be a fairly straightforward situation. That's our baseline scenario. But now we have this personal use situation of in it, making it kind of like this vacation home scenario, which complicates the calculations. So now let's bring it back to the to a, a, an a easy scenario where we're we're not going to worry about us converting it to a, to a vacation home, but rather we'll just say that it is a vac a vacation home for the entire year, having both rental days and uh, personal days uses of the vacation home, right? Okay. So to do that, I'm going to go back on over to our worksheet and I'm going to say the depreciation. Uh, let's go to our depreciation and let's just put it on there for the full year. 010123 for, so I'm going to say 010123. And so let's start with that. So we have the full year and then we're going to say, okay, how do we calculate the, the personal through business usage? So what we have to do is we, we have to do something like this. We got to say personal use of the dwelling. If you have a personal use of a dwelling unit uh, that you rent, you must divide your expenses between the rental use and the personal use. Now, remember the income is what it is. That's straightforward because the income was exclusively from the rental use. It's the expenses that we have to break out. So in general, your rental expenses will be no more than your total expenses multiplied by a fraction, the denominator of which is the total number of days the dwelling unit uh, is used and the number uh, and the numerator of which is the total number of uh, total number of days actually rented. So in other words, you have to come up with, okay, what was the use? When did I use the dwelling unit? Let's say we used it for 10 days and then when was it actually rented not available for rent so this is much more restricted and let's say we had it we had it actively rented for 60 days that comes out to a total of the 70 days so notice we can then look at the percentages which would be 10 over 70 and then this equals 60 over 70 I'm going to percentify these, go into the home tab, number percentify, summing these up equals the sum, boom, and that comes out to 100%. Notice what the denominator is not. We're not, we're, so the, the rental use we're going to say uh, is 86. Notice we didn't use a denominator of like 365 days in the year or anything like that. So we, so we had to use the, the, the usage of the home we basically removed the vacant use of the home, which might be a little bit different if it was completely rental property and we were trying to rent it the entire time, we might assume it to be rental property basically the entire time, even when we have the vacant situation. Here, when we have the vacant situation, we're gonna, in essence, remove those from the ratio calculation. So I just wanna point that out because if you're thinking about it rationally, you could come up with different scenarios assuming that when the, no one is using it, you could assume that that would either be time spent for personal or time spent on the rental use, right? So there's multiple ways you can conceive it. Of course, we're trying to follow the guidelines of the code. So now we're going to say that, that the rental use uh, we're going to say is the 86%. So if I go back on over and I'm going to say, all right, that means that over here, I'd say now the property is going to be do, 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 and we're going to go down to additional information and say it was 0.86. And then that's the land and the building additional information 0.86. So now I'm going to go back to the forms. And we can say in the the depreciation we're going to say regular so now we still had it on the books for 93 333 but based on this calculation i'm going to say 86 percent is for the business use and the depreciation is the depreciable part then is 86 percent of that or 80,266 then we apply that straight line mid-month 27.5 now the thing that's funny about this is in the following year 
that number might change, right? Because you have a different depreciable, you know, basis uh, from year to year on how much is going to be rental versus versus the personal. And but as you depreciate it, you're still going to be looking up and accounting for the adjusted accumulated depreciation to give you the adjusted basis of the property. So that gets a little bit kind of wonky to consider from from year to year uh, as you're using it for you know the vacation home. All right, and then so once we have that, then we also then if we had our our normal expenses again, here's are going to be our normal expenses. We'll say da, 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 and then we're going to say now the interest for the rental part of the property is going to be the 15,000 times the rental use 86% F4 and copying that down da, 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 da. and then the personal use is going to be possibly just this by this or the, minus that that's the four or the 14% and once again maybe the personal amount for the interest and the property taxes we could still possibly take on the schedule a if it still qualifies as a, a home because we might be able to say it's our second home and therefore I should be able to get the deduction for the rental portion on the rental side and possibly the schedule a on the other side so you got to make sure that it would qualify as a home to see whether or not that would be possible to take them both on the schedule a and uh, the the rental property which is going to have to do with how much time uh, you, you use it as a personal residence which might but not be sufficient you know in this particular case with the only personal use of uh, the 10 days right so you're going to have to so that's another thing to kind of be aware of within your calculations if it's thought of as a home uh, then you might get a benefit of being able to deduct the, the interest and the property taxes but you also might be restricted in the event that there are losses even more restricted than you would otherwise be with the passive activity rules so here's just an idea of that if if you use a dwelling unit as a home during the tax year if you use it for personal purposes more than the greater of we have the 14 days so using it more than greater than 14 days 10 percent of the total days it is rented to others at fair rental price so let's for example consider a loss situation here so now let's say say that if i go back to my schedule e i'm i and, and i didn't fully adjust my scenario before i'm just going to pretend we had a loss based on the calculations here so let's just say this was uh this was one hundred and thirty thousand. so now i'm just going to look at a loss scenario so if I go to my Schedule E, so now we've got 130,000, we've got a $36,000 uh, loss. Now, the question is, did we actively participate or not? The default usually is we actively participated. So the idea now being, well, if the rental property uh, is qualifying as rental property, typically that falls into the passive activity rules with regards to losses so if there was income in other words not a problem the iris is just going to take part of it if it's a loss the iris is going to say okay we're going to possibly limit the losses on the rental property the general rule as we saw in prior presentations is that it's going to be considered passive income which means you can net the losses against passive income not active income and there's also at risk limitations we talked about but uh if you actively participate in the rental process which is usually the kind of like the default position and your income is not above a certain threshold you might still be able to, to take up to 25 percent of the losses against other income so we can see that here on uh, the depreciation well this is the depreciation amortization this is the passive activity loss limitations so here we have this we have the basically the income limits here it's allowing us to take of this 36269 on the form 1040 the uh 25,000 against the other w2 income now if my w2 income was higher than that then 
it's going to phase out. Let's say my W-2 income was 150000 then it's no longer allowing me to take that 25000 So that's now it's, it's treating it as the passive activity rules. So let's put it back to 100000 So now we're able to, to uh, take that loss. Let's go back on over. But now let's imagine that, and, and by the way, I should have been putting my number of days here since it's a separate property. So let's go back to my days. Uh, da, 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 and we're going to say, where's the number of days in my data input? So I've got the number of days rented 60 and then the personal use 10. If I pull that over, here's the the 60 and 10. And so we're going to say, okay, and it's still giving us the 25,000. And if I go then to the form 1040, allowing us to take that against the other income, let's bring my income back up to 100,000 though. I put 10,000, 100,000. And so there it is there. But let's say my personal use days then go up over 15. Let's say we used it personally for 20 days. And then I'm going to go back on over and say, boom, it now removed it on the schedule E and it's gotten more restrictive because, because now I've got the 36, uh, 269 of the loss, but it's a vacation home, right? So here's our, our categorization of the vacation home and it's not a lot. It's, so it's more restrictive even than the passive property because if it was passive property, I would typically get to net it out against other passive income and I could take the loss that way and then possibly take the passive loss against future passive income and losses. Whereas here, now it's a vacation home. So I can't theoretically net it out possibly against other passive losses. Uh, and I don't get that 25,000 deduction on the form 1040. And if I carry forward the loss, I can't take it against other passive income. I have to line it up against that particular property. So it's even more streamlined in terms of when I might get the loss. I haven't completely lost it, but it's a lot more uh, restricted in terms of what income I can net it out against. Okay, so then in terms of the vacation home, or if we have a second piece of property, the questions that come up are, is the second piece of property rental property or a second home? If it's rental property and it's solely for rental use, then it's a pretty straightforward situation typically and you have the passive income rules and you have to see if you actively participate, possibly getting that 25,000 of deduction if you actively participate as long as your AGI is below a certain threshold, adjusted gross income. If you use it as vacation home for partial use, then you get into the question of one, I have to allocate between personal use and vacation home use, which I'm, which I'm going to have to use some kind of ratio to allocate the expenses between the two. Two, is it qualified as a home or not, which will be dependent in part on the allocation of our personal use, which comes, which enters into the question as whether or not we're going to be able to deduct on the schedule A, the amount of the personal use property as basically a re as our, our, our home and two, what's going to be the impact in the event of a loss? Because if we have a loss, then it's going to be restricted under normal rules for the passive activity rules, but it might be more restrictive if we had more personal use within it, because uh, as we saw in this case, it's going to be in its own like little lane, even more restricted than the passive activity lanes and not give us that nice activity, actively participating component is the general idea. So that's just a general overview. I did the, the data input just to get an idea of, of that. If I missed uh, any, any of the data or confused anybody in trying to put the different scenarios together, uh, I apologize for that, but we're just trying to go back and forth and get some scenarios using the software to give us an idea of the differences. And software is quite useful to be able uh, to do that, changing the factors, looking in, 
thinking about why the rules are being applied and how they're being applied within the software then reflected in the forms.